The Department of Defense is in an era of accelerated modernization, as focus shifts to peer and near-peer competition. We spoke with the Honorable John Sherman, Chief Information Officer for the Department of Defense, to learn more about the DOD's current priorities, what the $9 billion cloud contract means for the department, and what lies ahead for the DOD in the coming years. Mr. Sherman was officially sworn in as DOD CIO in December 2021, and prior to joining the department, he served as the Intelligence Community CIO. Mr. Sherman is also a 2022 WASH 100 award winner. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for the leaders of GovCon, please drop a comment below or email studio at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Maya, and here to speak with me today is the Honorable John Sherman, Chief Information Officer for the Department of Defense. Mr. Sherman, thank you so much for joining us today. Summer, it's great to be here with you. So to set the scene for our conversation, can you give me your present outlook on the global defense landscape? Certainly. So the global defense landscape is evolving significantly. Here within the Department of Defense, we just released recently a national defense strategy based on President Biden's national security strategy. This new NDS, as we call it, recognizes this evolving global situation. It's really based around three pillars. Just briefly, one is integrated deterrence, using all levers of national power for our national security and those of our allies and core national interests. Secondly, something we call campaigning, which is a logically linked set of activities to also further those goals of national security. And finally, working closely with allies across the globe in pursuit of our common core shared interests. This NDS drives so much of what we do here at Department of Defense, really everything, and particularly what I'm doing as CIO and working with my teammates as we modernize our digital capabilities to make sure we can do integrated deterrence, we can do campaigning and work closely with allies. And Mr. Sherman, I know the DOD has notably shifted its focus away from counterterrorism and towards peer and near peer competition in recent years. I'm curious, what emerging technologies do you feel will have the greatest impact on our standing in the great power competition in the next few years? And where are you seeing opportunities for accelerated, meaningful tech growth in the U.S.? So to build on my previous answer here about the evolving landscape, one of our key focus areas in the national defense strategy is what we call our pacing challenge, which is the People's Republic of China. And on that, that doesn't mean we are bound for confrontation with them or conflict, but we are in competition. So looking at the technological landscape and also as we look at other global challenges like Russia and their invasion of the democratic nation of Ukraine, Technologies that we can bring to the fight on areas like cloud computing, areas like proliferated low Earth orbit or PLEO satellite communications that we read about in the news a lot, bringing Internet access across the globe, new types of fiber transport terrestrially to be able to get data at massive speeds around the world, and very importantly, new cybersecurity capabilities to, to contribute to that integrated deterrence I mentioned vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, and others. There's all kinds of new technologies there. And then building upon that, as we look at things like quantum technologies and how do we leverage that both for protection and other, other areas that we can bring that to bear. And then finally, very importantly, cloud is a means to an end. And one of those means to an end is using that for software development or development security and operations, DevSecOps, which is an agile approach to software development and being able to really lean forward on that and working with the military services, working with us in the Office of Secretary, Secretary of Defense and the many software factories we have across DOD, really making it about the software. And this is an evolving area we should never be satisfied on, and we're going to keep pushing on that area. Mr. Sherman, you mentioned cloud, and I want to dig into that a little bit deeper. I know the DOD recently awarded its $9 billion Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability Contract, and that award really represents a meaningful step in the DOD's cloud adoption journey, which you've said has had its difficulties. 
I'm curious, can you explain the significance of JWCC, what it means for the future of the DOD, and how it propels JADC2 forward? So the Joint Warfighting Cloud capability really is a huge accomplishment for the department. As we look at this, it really provides several key features we haven't had before to include enterprise cloud, truly that spans the entire enterprise from the continental United States all the way out to what we call the tactical edge. Think of an island in the Pacific or a ship in the Black Sea or special operations forces maybe operating in sub-Sahara Africa. It operates at all three security classifications, unclassified, secret, top secret. We've had other cloud capabilities on which we built our knowledge and expertise, but none have provided that entire panoply of unclass, secret, top secret that I just described. Also, it does create an environment where we can have commercial parity with those amazing capabilities that the four companies to whom we awarded, Microsoft, Oracle, Google, and Amazon Web Services, world-class companies can bring to the fight. And finally, it provides us an ability to work directly with those cloud service providers, uh, not going through an intermediary or reseller or middleman on that. But that's about the contract. Let me tell you what this is really going to bring us. Decision advantage. Being able to run workloads, to do things like AI, artificial intelligence, to do that software development I just talked about at speed of mission across the entire enterprise. And I'm really most excited how it's going to help us connect all across, whether it's combatant commands or here at the Pentagon or the services and military departments, but also out to that tactical edge having that cloud computing capability out where that Marine Littoral Regiment might be or that Army Brigade or Navy Carrier Strike Group to be able to provide that. And then when you intermingle that together with areas like that proliferated low Earth orbit satellite communications and marry that together with 5G for tactical use, you start to get a very powerful at the edge capability that we haven't had before that will create decision advantage and be able to allow us to put our adversary back on their heels in a potential conflict. And like you just hinted at, we are seeing a growing need for multi-domain integration. Can you explain why that's such an urgent need right now and how it will help us meet evolving national security missions? So we talk in the department about Joint All Domain Command and Control, or JADC2 as it's known by. Really, as you look across all the different domains of warfare, air, land, sea, space, cyberspace, and then when you take the domains one step further and looking at bringing in allies together, one of the key pillars of that national defense strategy, that's gonna really going to be our key foundation to being able to stand up against state actors such as China, Russia, and others to be able to bring together these coalitions, move data across these different physical domains, virtual domains, also not only defense data, but intelligence data, bringing it to the point of decision where a commander where she or he has what they need more quickly, more accurately, more holistically than their challenger does on the other side of the battle space, whether that's one mile looking through a gun side of a tank or 500 miles or 1,000 miles, and being able to work at depth across all these different components of this, that's what this is really about. We have to leverage technology to make this happen and looking at data, automation like AI and machine learning, and things like I just talked about with cloud computing and transport and satellite communications to be able to create this, as Secretary of Defense also likes to talk about, create dilemmas for a challenger or adversary more quickly than they can react to them. And that's what all this technology is really about, is keeping us on the forefront of that and being able to put a challenger where they are overwhelmed by dilemmas to where our troops survive, our service members, and we're able to do what we need to do for national security. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the cybersecurity conversation. I know the Pentagon just released its Zero Trust Strategy which lays out a roadmap for the DOD to adopt a never trust, always verify approach to security. And as you know, uh, Zero Trust is not um, a tangible IT solution or product, but instead a much broader and more holistic practice. In your opinion, what will Zero Trust success look like? Zero Trust 
is so to your point about what does success look like? I want, and maybe this gets into intelligence and everything else. I want some uh, colonel or general in an adversary nation yelling at their staff about how they weren't able to get into our systems. Now, I may not actually have insight into that, but as you said, it is about assuming an adversary is already on your network or system and then segmenting your system in a way where that adversary might get in, but they can't move laterally and certainly can't get to your critical data. We've talked about zero trust in the IT space and national security for many years, but with President Biden's executive order last year, really putting some thrust behind the, the imperative to get behind this, we at DOD strive to be leaders in this area, and we are. We did release a zero trust strategy, which we see as a seminal document, not only for DOD, but really the federal government, laying, about all the, laying out all the steps that need to occur to be able to get to what we call targeted zero trust by 2027, which is an aggressive timeline, and advanced zero trust by the year 2032, which is even the more advanced, well, as the title indicates, the advanced level of that. There's a lot that has to go into this. Identity credential access management, for example, tag the data, tag the people, making sure that we moved away from signature-based analysis to behavioral-based analysis, and all these things moving away from defense at the perimeter or even defense in depth to this paradigm of assumption that an adversary is on your network or weapon system, and how do you keep them from moving laterally to get to the data or the capability we really need to keep them away from? It is so critical for us, and we are determined to get after this. I'd like to ask you more about command control and communication, C3. I know the department has been hard at work at modernizing C3 capabilities, since the publication of its C3 modernization strategy in late 2020. I'm curious, where are the C3 priorities now in light of JWCC and JADC2, like we were discussing earlier? Command control communications is one of the areas that I get most excited about. And that also causes me to, to stay on my game very much too as CIO, because it really gets to some of the key warfighting aspects to fulfill that national defense strategy we talked about. There's so much that goes on in there, but a few areas I want to highlight. The first is electromagnetic spectrum operations, or IMSO as it's known, and which is the marriage of electronic warfare and spectrum operations, bringing that together. And of course, the U.S. military, working with our allies, have operated in this space for many years, going back to the Vietnam War and even before, up through Desert Storm, Bosnia, and elsewhere, but over the past 20 years, combating violent extremists, we've had to innovate in other areas like intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, survivability, support to special operations, et cetera. Electromagnetic spectrum operations, we're going to have to be able to fight and survive and maneuver in a highly contested and congested area. Think of the Western Pacific, Eastern Europe, other areas where our forces could be called upon against a state challenger or adversary. We stood up a new office to make sure we're overseeing, governing, budgeting properly for IMSO, and they're moving out. We work closely with U.S. Strategic Command, with General Tony Cotton there, who does the operational implementation of IMSO. But it's not just about kinetic operations now. A jammed spectrum can be just as lethal to our forces or hindering as going into a very contested anti-aircraft belt, for example. That's one area. I also mentioned earlier satellite communications and proliferated low Earth orbit and what opportunities that presents. We do this right. You hear the term DDIL, and the, the term has different uh, connotations or different word, letters with it, but denied, degraded, intermittent, latent is the one I always talk about. If we get the P Leo piece right, an adversary may not be able to put us into a DDIL environment hardly at all, which is a big worry as we have to maybe put Marines very far forward in the Western Pacific or others in other parts of the world. And that's something I get excited about. And one other area I want to hit on is positioning, navigation, and timing. GPS remains our gold standard, global positioning system that U.S. Space Force runs on behalf of not only DOD, but really the nation and our allies. But Having alternate sources of PNT are going to be critical because we know our pacing challenge and others want to threaten GPS and be able to hinder our ability to fight a 21st century fight with what GPS brings. So working across the services, making sure we have alternate complementary sources is an area that keeps me up to make sure we are staying ahead of that 
and also being as creative as we possibly can. That's interesting um, about the electromagnetic spe uh, spectrum operations. At one of our events last week, we had uh, the Navy Vice Admiral Jeffrey Trussler <laughs> speaking about how um, a lot of the Navy's systems are on the radio frequency spectrum and that um, sharing or vacating any parts of those spectrum would be a detriment to national security. So it's interesting to hear you speak on how important that is. So with that briefly, that is a key area too in the continental United States as we look at how best to manage spectrum with our interdepartmental colleagues of the Department of Commerce, the National Telecommunication Information Administration, and ultimately FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, where we balance our national security considerations to be able to train our forces and conduct homeland security while also creating economic opportunity for U.S. telecommunication industry and not moving the rear stat too far one way or another. And that's an area that falls under the MSO spectrum, but is very special for the continental United States and something in an interagency that I focus on heavily from this position. Thank you. And Mr. Sherman, I'd like to talk about the cyber workforce, which is low density and very high demand. It seems like everyone is competing for the same talent between government and industry. I'm curious, how is the department approaching the workforce of the future and competition with industry for talent? This is a, such a key area, and I've noted as recently as the last couple of weeks in, on comments I've given that technology is critical, but without the people, the women and men behind it, we're not going to be able to advance the way we need to be. So getting after this and thinking about a 30-year career in government is not going to be the watchword going forward. We have to work closely with the industry. We must think differently about how we recruit, upskill, retain, have some fungibility in the workforce. We've got to be able to leverage every capability that Congress has given to us, what we have in our own authorities here, and to be able to have a workforce that looks like America. That's so important. Our diversity is our strength here in the United States. This is something that gives us greater flexibility and creativity against our pacing challenge and others. So we have a new workforce, cyber workforce strategy coming out very soon that really seeks to push along on this. We are also doing a lot of behind the scenes work, leveraging what we already have at our disposal, like cyber accepted service, where we can hire a little bit more quickly, where we can have a little bit different salary for folks coming in with cyber and digital skills. And even behind the scenes from that, pick and shovel work on something we call the Defense Cyber Workforce Framework, where we frame the work roles that we have over 50 of them for digital and cyber and AI and data to understand how many people we have in the different work roles and where we need to throttle up more aggressive hiring using some of these capabilities and, and incentives we have or other areas where we're looking pretty good on it. But this is something we need to actively manage, but we're constantly going to be uh, tweaking this thinking creatively and all never forgetting that it's about the people, the women and men who make up the workforce. And again, who may not want to come to DOD for 30 years, but we want to come here for a few years, go to industry and come back. And how do we make that work? This is something that uh, defies easy, simple uh, strategies, but we're going to get after this and we have full backing from our leadership to make sure we think creatively on this front. Well, Mr. Sherman, thank you so much for the conversation today and for all the work you do at the DOD. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to serve here.